What do you do when the humor doesn't land? Is there a, here's the four steps to take when a joke bombs <laughs> yeah. or the room just, you suck all the air out? Yeah, so there are, we get failure wrong when it comes to humor. We think that failure means no one laughs. And the research is actually pretty, um, pretty helpful and optimistic here that if we make a joke and it doesn't get a laugh, um, there's actually a, a body of work done by researchers, done by um, Allison Wood Woodbrooks, Maurice Schweitzer, um, and uh, and a couple others at Harvard and Wharton that shows if you use humor, as long as it's appropriate, if it fails to get a laugh, it still increases people's perceptions of your confidence and competence and has no meaningful impact on perceptions of status. And so as long as you're not doing this like every five minutes, it's actually not so bad to fail in that way. Now, the really bad failure is where you you make a joke that's inappropriate, that crosses a line, that hurts someone's feelings. And when we do this, that it's so easy to write it off and say, well, that person just didn't get it. They didn't get the joke. They're being too sensitive. And a humor fail is an empathy fail before anything else, because humor is this super unique, um, context-dependent art form. And so when you do fail, um, get really curious. What are you missing? What, um, what's the context that you're missing? What is the empathy fail that you've, that you've made? Because especially as leaders, we lose our barometer for what is appropriate with humor. Because we know from the research that when you rise in status, people laugh because you're the boss, not necessarily because you're funny. Um, so we always have our leaders create a set of trusted testers. So people in the organization, maybe it's your COO or whoever it is that you know that you can trust. And before going into a big presentation or a pitch um, or an all-hands meeting, ask the question, hey, um, how could this land poorly? Help me understand how this could go poorly, which is a very different question to ask than, hey, is this funny? Because people will be like, yeah, cool, that sounds good, it's funny, but how can this land poorly? Um, that'll help illuminate some some sort of blind spots that you might have going into it. Yeah, that's great to have someone else who can look at all the angles and go, well, I think you're not thinking about how it could affect this person and how it could be taken in that right. context. Right, Naomi might be so self-conscious about her audio, and so you calling your audio perfect and hers awful Thank you. could break her. Thanks for, you're clearly still bitter about that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I will hold this. Unbelievable. This. Well, one of, the, <laughs> one of the goals of this podcast is to help leaders grow themselves, their teams, and their profits. And it's pretty clear to me how humor can help you do that. But for those who still might not be clear, we talked about the benefits, but what do the results look like when you do this well, when you start to integrate this intentionally? Yeah, so um, the the research is super compelling around sales as well. So one of our favorite studies and one of our favorite studies researchers had individuals come into the lab and negotiate over the purchase price of a piece of art. So you, George, are walking to the lab, you're negotiating with the person across from you, you're trying to buy this art piece. And in half of these conditions, the negotiating partner offered you a final offer that was significantly above your final bid. And they simply said, my final offer is X. So that was half of the, of the participants. For the other half, exact same experiment, exact same script, same percentage above your final bid, but they said, my final offer is X and I'll throw in my pet frog. Now, this is an objectively awful joke showing that the bar is incredibly low in business, um, but the impact was significant. So those in the pet frog condition reported, or they were willing to pay on average an 18% higher price for that item. And what's even more profound is they walked away from the exper experiment saying that they enjoyed the experience more, saying that they felt less tension with the seller, and saying that they liked the person across the table more. So, um, and this, this is borne out in, in a number of different experiments around sales. I think probably for this moment in time, more than anything, um, it's humor's impact on retention and humor's impact on our ability to, um, to attract and retain top talent. And this is, so Jennifer Ocker and I teach a course at the business school at Stanford called A New Type of Leader. And the premise is that it used to be that leaders needed to be revered. Now they need to be understood and they need to connect. People no longer want to work um, in places where they can't bring their full selves to work. And so the majority of the leaders that we're working with right now are undertaking enormous cultural shifts to try and make it safe for people to, to bring their full selves to work 
and to create environments where people feel like valued members of a winning team on an inspired mission. Mm. We talk a lot about bosses versus leaders around here. And one of the keys is bosses don't lead with humility and humor, but it is one of the hallmarks of a great leader. And I look at, you know, Dave Ramsey, our CEO, and he embodies this. And so that's a huge way to go, how do I make that shift? Oh, I'm just going to lean into humility and humor and connect with my team instead of just pushing them, telling them what to do. That's huge. Yeah. And a little more humanity. I mean, I think that's the that's the first step here is just bringing more of our humanity to work, telling stories from the weekend, um, being more candid and transparent about our follies, about the mistakes that we've made. And when we do that, our when we bring more of our humanity, our sense of humor really naturally follows. Mm. 